We are excited to welcome here uh, to celebrate Shantara McBride and Rosalind Wiseman for their book, Courageous Discomfort. Yeah. Uh, how to have important, brave, life-changing conversations about race and racism. It's an empowering handbook on how to have candid conversations around race and become a better advocate. Written by a black woman and a white woman who ask and answer 20 common, uncomfortable, but critical questions about racism. Uh, McBride and Wiseman will be in conversation with Lena Durholly, a Palestinian American psychotherapist in private practice and best selling author of true crime and nonfiction books with a focus on violence prevention. Her most recent book, The Facebook Narcissist, on how to identify and protect yourself and your loved ones from social media narcissism, examines the role uh, social media plays in the rising narcissism in society today. We do have some of those available as well. Um, I'm going to let Lena say a little bit more about our authors today. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Shantara McBride, Rosalind Wiseman, and Lena Derhali. Is this on? Oh, it is on. Yep. Okay, great. Hi. Okay, hi. We're getting more chairs. Yes, first, and, we're, and we're opening the windows. Um, before I introduce these two, um, I call them iconic women. Just on behalf of the three of us, I want to thank everybody for being here and being in discussion with us today. Obviously, I've read this book. I think it's an incredible, incredible piece of work that everybody should read. So um, we're only going to scratch the surface today. We do not have enough time to get into all the meat and potatoes here. But um, I encourage everybody to buy a book, to let people know about this book, to share it with your family, your friends, your children. So without further ado, I, I'm going to read their bios. I have Shantara here yeah. to my left. And Shantara McBride is a Texas-based author, preacher, speaker, and teacher. She is the founder of Marvelous University, a social enterprise that offers life coaching and success planning for young people, specializing in leadership development for girls and young women. Shantara was awarded the Profiles in Leadership Award from SMU for having made a significant impact on the city of Dallas and on the quality of life of girls and women all over the country. She is the author of Love Your Jiggle, The Girl's Guide to Being Marvelous, an inspirational book for girls ages 11 to 17. Shantara is also an active member of the country's oldest historically black sorority, Appa Kappa Alpha. Rosalind, to my right, Rosalind Wiseman, is a Colorado-based speaker and best-selling author, perhaps best known, and everybody here I'm sure knows of this, queen bees and wannabes, helping your daughter survive cliques, gossip, boyfriends, and the new realities of girl world. The basis for the hit movie and Broadway musical Mean Girls. She has authored several other parenting books, including Masterminds and Wingmen, Helping Our Boys Cope with Schoolyard Power, Locker Room Tests, Girlfriends, and the New Rules of Boy World. She's also a parent of two boys in a recent empty nester, correct? And uh, Distance Learning, Playbook for Parents, How to Support Your Child's Academic, Emotional, and Social Learning in Any Setting, and Owning Up Curriculum. Rosalind is a regular contributor to National Public Radio, The New York Times, The Today Show, and other national media. So please welcome Rosalind and Shantara and congratulate yeah. them on this amazing accomplishment. I'm going to put my book to the side. Yes. Yes. Let's see, I have some friends here in the back. Okay, so you may be wondering, we have Shantara, a black woman, Rosalind, a white woman, and why they wrote this book together. So first and foremost, can you tell us about your relationship your journey together as friends and how that evolved into writing this book. And so Rosalind, let's start with you and then All right. can pass well, to Shantara. First and foremost, yes, I live in Colorado, but I am from here. And this is right. And this is my neighborhood bookstore. Um, so, um, you know, and I it's you know, I did the first Queen Bees and Wannabes signing here. I'm sure some of you were here when that was happening. Um, and then the reason, and many of you know this, and supported the efforts, actually, of what I was trying to do, is that Shantara um, worked for, um, what was Greg's organization called? Community Impact. Community Impact. Probably some of you donated to that, too. Um, that Greg Taylor was the executive director and hired Shantara. 
who was a VISTA volunteer, and um, called me and said, I have just hired somebody who is going to leave me and go work with you and become like your closest friend. And I said, that's really a weird thing to say. And he was right. She actually did leave him. <laughs> and um, she actually came to work with me when she was in her car um, getting ready to move back to Dallas. And I called her when she was getting in the car to go back to Dallas, and um, I said, do you want to come work with me? And Shantara believes in signs mm -hmm. from things above, <laughs> and um, that was sort of it. And then we've been like talking and arguing ever since. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> it was one of those things where I was. I was planning to move back home to Dallas, and I, you know how you don't really want to do something, but I felt there was a lot of stuff happening with the family, and I'm one of those control, per nobody here is like that, but I <laughs> am like that, and I figured if I just move back to Dallas, then all the stuff that's going wrong would not go wrong. Um, and, but I also was very open to divine intervention, and I said, listen, I'm open. And then Ross called, and I told her. I was like, I was on my way back to Dallas and then I told her, I said I still have to go because it was around the holidays you know so you got to go get the good food I said so I'm going to do that but I'll come back and I'll work with you and I said now what do you do again because I didn't really remember and she told me and I was like oh that sounds like something I can do and and truly I came back and we have been connected ever since yeah so how did that evolve into writing this book tell us about how this idea came about and why this book, why now? You know, for me, it was, I was getting, the summer of 2020 changed everybody's life. And, if, and I think also mixed with the pandemic, like you had time to sit at home, you had time to watch television, you had time to see what was going on. And I won't ever watch the video of George Floyd being murdered. I just, I, for my own personal reasons, can't do it, won't do it. And I was getting messages from well-intentioned, well-intentioned white friends that were asking me like, should I send you flowers? Should I buy your family dinner? And part of me wanted to say yes, but I, that wasn't what they were trying to do. You know, it wasn't gonna fix anything, but I, I knew the lane of they were trying to absolve their own guilt and they were trying to, and I was, so I would call Ross and we have the kind of friendship you don't have to do the fake pleasantries like how you doing hi the kids i didn't care i was really like you would not believe the messages that i'm getting and so from that it was just this this vomit every time i would get a message of like you would not believe and um james james her husband said you know because we were going to write an article and her husband reminded us that we're both speakers um and i kind of forgot and we we're like oh yeah and so he said you should do a webinar so we did the first one and we had a lot of people attend and it was around how to be an ally because i knew that's what people were trying to do with messages to me and then from that we would had so many questions so we did another one um and then her literary agent reached out and was like i need a meeting with you and shantara and he said we should write a book so we did and a journal and and the conversation and card a, an inspirational deck of cards yes that we yes. have not made yet no so we've been busy you know, being an author it's a very independent kind of career you're very much on your own it's very solitary so what was it like writing a book with a friend especially writing about a topic like this black white like how was that process can you be candid with us yeah. uh yeah um yeah um um so we've had years and years and years of working um, in trainings and curricula together that were in and out of these issues, but definitely disagreeing with each other or seeing having to work things out on, uh, on uncomfortable stuff. And we've just done that for a really long time. So, um, and it did not make it less hard that um, when we first started, and, and all through, that um, I, I'll, I'll own uh, that I was the person who would often say to Shantara, yeah, white people aren't going to get this. Like the, what she was writing. I was like, they're not. 
they're not. And she would, at first she got really mad at me. And then I, you know, said, well, you can be mad at me, but I'm right about this. And, and it, was just, it was specifically on the explanation of things in the world being systemic racism. So for Shantara, obviously, it's really understandable and in the air that she breathes that systemic racism is a full explanation of why things are happening. And my response to that when some, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes was we have to actually make this visual for white people or people that cannot relate to what you are saying. And that does not take away, the way we're gonna get there is to visualize. And so that was really painful because I think it, you know, it's like she trusts me so she knows I am not dismissing the experience or the reality or just, you know, the existence of systemic racism. It is how do we actually accomplish the goal of getting people who this is not their every, they think is not their everyday experience, so they're benefiting from it, but they don't see it that way. How do we get them to see it? And um, and that was one thing where just you know it was just it was just me sometimes saying like I, they're I don't think people are going to get it. Would you add anything, Shantara? Did she cover it? <laughs> I mean, it, that was that was tough. Um, and very frustrating because as a black woman living in these United States, you, you already feel that you have to over explain. And so it was frustrating to feel like, okay, <laughs> this woman is telling me <laughs> that I have to over explain. And that, that's what I always feel like I have to do. I always, feel, you know, and so to hear that, was extremely frustrating. And there were days we would get off the phone and, and just not resolve it, but just like, okay, fine. And just hang up, you know? And, and, and thankfully, thank, cause th remember the, okay, fine. And we would, we would be on like Google meet so you could see the whole face. No, you did it to me in person. Did in, I really? Yes. In Colorado. Remember you wouldn't talk to me all the way. Oh there. my <laughs> God. Y'all. <laughs> We were in, oh my goodness, we were in Colorado and we were having these, one of these, you know, very low key, no, very heated discussions. And she was taking me to the airport and I seriously was trying to figure out if, if I get out right now, how long will it take me to walk to Denver airport? Like it was, I, I did not want to be in the car with her anymore. And it was that frustrating that I know I was on my phone like, if I get out now, what is the distance? And it was, it was a day, you know, that would take me to walk. But I was so frustrated. She was right, but I didn't want to do it. And I didn't want to have to explain. It is such a frustrating thing to do that I didn't want to have to do it with my own book. And now looking at it, I was like, oh. It's much better. And it, it was actually much better for me because it got away from just these blanket labels and it got me to a place of explaining and not feeling like it's taking anything away from me, but just wanting to be true. Like, well, you know what, let me explain. Because I can put down a label, I can say what it is, but then that means some people will leave the conversation after that. They will hear it, they will hear that label, they will hear that explanation, I'm like, oh, well, she's not talking about she's not talking to me or talking about something that's going on but having to explain it made it much better did i want to get out the car absolutely did it make it much better absolutely so when writing a book and when you uh, sell a book to a publisher the one of the first things they want to know well one they want you to make money for them but two they want to know who is your audience who is your target audience and so um, I think I know, but I want to ask you guys to tell the audience, who is the audience for this book? Is it white people? Is it everybody? And if you are going to ask our audience today to take one thing from this book, what would it be? Roz? Oh. I'm gonna start um, with you, Uncle. Yeah. Um, so when we started, you know, we wanted it to be for all people, which is not possible. Um, we, that's what we came to the conclusion about. And, and really, and I don't know if we're going to do this, but there was definitely a thing, and we saw it when we were at UT a couple of days ago, that um, that there, there, we had a young black man come up to us um, who's like a postdoc, has like 400 letters after his name, um, that, but, one, but came up to us and, and asked the question of, 
which is the inverse of a question we're asking in the book. Um, and the question is, um, do, I, do I have to be your friend? I want to keep, keep this friendship, but. So how do you maintain a friendship where you've got things in the friendship that are really a problem when somebody, if they, you've got somebody who's talk, who has different opinions than you do or says things about race or racism or different kinds of isms? And um, so this young man was asking us about how he keeps friendships as a young black man um, and that he's really thought about that and who are the people that he neither needs to cut off from or keep in his life, not gonna, that kind of thing. But it all to say that we actually really came down to um, that this book really is for people, the way I perceive it is that these people, this is for people that are not black and brown who are mostly white. We have Asian people talking about the experiences they have with racism in both ways where they are part of the, sort of, you know, in the dominant race um, privilege and when they're not. Um, and so we, so the, complexity of the, the complexities of this are obvious and then we had to choose a lane. And that lane was, um, was complicated and we knew that we were leaving behind things that we felt strongly about. Um, or that we couldn't that we couldn't include. Um, so, but that's what we we chose. What we chose, frankly, is we have gone around the country. I'll speak for myself. I know that we both have gone around the country to all different kinds of communities, from the communities that perceive themselves to be the most liberal to the ones that say they're the most conservative. And that has not, frankly, been my experience. Most some liberal. I live in Boulder, Colorado now. That place is not as liberal as it thinks it is, <laughs> at all. It is as racist as all as the rest of the country. Um, but what I wanted was for the people who've read my parenting books, who are so much advocating for taking care of their children and reading books, which I'm very grateful for, for buying parenting books, I want them to see this book as as important to them and parenting as every other book I've written. Shantara. Yeah. yeah, the only thing I would add is I really, I wrote it for people, one who kept sending me messages. Um, and so, and a lot of the people who did send me messages and who do send me messages, and it's, um, Instagram is so amazing because people think they know you. And so they just slide into your DMs and they ask you questions. And you're like, hold on, let me look at your profile. We're not friends. Oh, okay, let me, you know. And so I wrote it for people who keep asking me questions. And honestly, the most of the people that ask questions are white women. But having close friends who are Asian American or who are even Latina, you know, ask me questions or they talk about their own experience, I couldn't leave that out. What was really hard is not being able to put everything in the book, right? So having to narrow it down. And that's when we came up with the questions. Because believe it or not, we started writing a book on becoming allies. Like that was the whole, remember that way, way at the beginning? And it was like, okay, we're gonna write about how to be a good ally. And it quickly changed from, no, no, people want to ask questions, i.e. the Instagram, you know? Um, they wanna ask questions that, that if they ask in a large setting or if they ask, someone may immediately deem them as racist, right? And we don't say that word out loud because it's you know not a con word. So it was like, that's, those are the questions that people want to ask. And I, don't, I frankly don't want people to rush to say I'm an ally. I always ask people, think about it. Because as an ally, that means you have to lose something. And, and you may not want to, and that's cool. Right, just, that's okay, that's between you and you. But before you jump to saying, well, I, you know, as an, and I had someone say to me, you know, as an ally, and I was like, ooh. Cause I don't, why are you leading with that? Right, cause that doesn't make me feel any safe just because you said no, 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 you know? And so it really, we wanted a book that gave people an invitation. And, and I was talking to someone earlier, this, this is an offering. This is an offering of another way to, to come to the table, to really think about, do I wanna be an ally? Am I an advocate? Like, well, let me answer these questions first for myself, and then let's see what role I can play in the bigger picture. And it's a, it's a beautiful book in the sense that it's digestible, but it's deep, and it's written very sensitive in a very sensitive way, and it's really accessible 
but it also asks all of us to just think deeper. I think that's what I really loved about it. it even, you know, I, I questioned a lot myself reading it because I'm the fired up person who gets angry. I'm like, cut them off, cut off uncle Harry. And you know, <laughs> I don't need to delete, delete, delete. I don't, but you know, I think it was really, um, nice to think that it's not black and white, no pun intended. You know, um, and so I think that it really is just it's a lot deeper than that. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of thought that goes into it, especially when we look at relationships with people. There's and I'm uh, my first profession is a relational psychotherapist. So I, it was very. And so let's get into the book a little bit then. We're, um, I have a bunch of questions. We're not going to be able again to get into. There's 20 chapters, 20 questions. We're not going to be able to get into even probably three or four of them at this point. So, again, I urge you to read the book, but I did, you know, I did put down some questions that I thought that some people here might have asked before and that we could sort of look at those a little bit. So I think speaking out was one thing, especially post George Floyd, that I thought was an important part of the book is that a lot of people are afraid to speak out, whether it's over text message, whether it's over a conversation, if it's somebody they really love or they're really close to. And again, as you say in the book, it's understandable. There's a lot of sensitivity to why it's so hard to speak out. But why is it important to not remain silent uh, when we recognize prejudice, discrimination, and racism in our everyday lives? And I also want to say the word dignity is important to both of you. And can you also please share what dignity means when it comes to speaking out against injustice and racism? Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to do first? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do why is it important to not remain silent? And then I'll throw the, so I'll throw that to Shantaren and okay. then I'll throw the dignity cool. part to you. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Okay, so for example, you know when you are with a group of people and something is going wrong and, and, and when people are quiet and then you, but you want to say something in your mind but nobody else is saying something and so you feel like if I say something then I'm going to look like I'm going to be the one and then so I'm not going to say anything and I'm not. When we see the stuff that, when we see a lot of stuff that is happening in our country, especially when it comes to um, black men being killed, when it comes to black women being killed, when it comes to um, just the injustice that we see, the inequality that we see with our education, um, the inequality that we see with pay, the in I mean, I could go on and on. So the silence gives an idea or an impression of agreement. Like I'm not gonna say anything, on, even though on the inside I may not agree. But if you're silent, it gives the idea, the impression, oh, they must, they must agree with what's happening because they're, they're quiet. If they didn't agree, then they would say something, right? Because that's what we think is human nature. If they don't agree, then somebody's going to say something. And a lot of times when the silence starts happening, it gives the impression of agreement. One of the examples that we have in the book is... Um, Remember being on the playground when we were younger? And imagine someone is being bullied. And imagine after the bullying is going on, then a kid comes and say, man, they shouldn't have done that. I am so sorry they did that to you. And the first time, you're like, oh, OK, thanks. You know? The second time, man, I'm so sorry they did that to you. That, that's really bad. You're like, uh-huh. The third time, man, I'm so sorry. They, they should not do that. And the third time, you're like, get away from me. I don't trust you just like I don't trust them. Because it doesn't feel genuine. It's like, how can you keep apologizing, but you're standing by and watching it happen? Tell somebody, tell a teacher, do something. It's the same way when it comes to systemic racism. It's the same way when we see the injustice happening in our world, two people, and you don't even have to know the person. Remember, I was getting offered dinners and flowers for, I don't, I don't know George Floyd, but I know George Floyd. You talk a little bit about trust with that, about white people feeling like, oh. how can you not trust me? <laughs> There's another story in the book, um, and I was out with some friends, and, and I just was like, thinking, because we were writing, so I was thinking about the book, and so I just walked up to the table, and I was like, okay, if I were to ask you all, if you trust white people, or if you don't trust white people, what would you, if you don't trust white people, what would you say? And without missing a beat, all of them said, because. 
and we ordered chips and queso. Like it, we didn't even have to, there was no more discussion needed. Cause I knew what they meant. They knew what I'm, it was like this unspoken. And when we started writing about that, it was this, <laughs> it was like, they said because? I was like, yeah. And we didn't even have to talk about it. Because the idea is there is this unspokenness that happens in our society that white people feel like, well, you should trust me because. Because I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm not like positive them. Positive experiences. Yes, with me. I'm nice to you. We went to dinner the other day. We went to school together. We went to school. My kids play with your kids, and it's like, so? I'm, listen, because the history of being black or a person of color in America shows us that. We just need to watch just a little bit longer. Just watch, just watch. And then also I think the thing that I realized doing this book was the amount of like <gasps> that I watched with white people being like, how could you not trust me? And my response watching this was, how do you not, how are we not realizing that in the book we talk about the past is prologue to the present? that we need to come, we don't need to know exactly someone's specific story in life to just have a possibility when we talk to them that there is a lot that might be informing the way in which we're interacting with people. And so to be immediately go to, I'm hurt because you don't trust me. Um, you, I, I would really like people to just take a moment right there and say, what is going on with me that that is my first reaction? Instead of saying, what is the possibility and being curious in that moment about what's the possibility that's happening that why this person is not and and then being able to talk about it which is why we wanted to talk about it in the book about how so um and so i've been really i was really struck by that in the process of, of writing because i didn't quite under i didn't quite the benefit of being in the work that i've done is that i've had lots of uncomfortable conversations with a lot of people for a long time so I, I, it was, it really did strike me. Um, and then, um, and it's not personal, right? Like we, I, that's when you're in a dominant position of race or sexual economic class or whatever, you take things very personally, which is really interesting because you are benefiting from the system so that you have this privilege. And it's a really interesting dynamic about how fast people take things personally when they really just again need to sit and be like wait a minute what what are the possible reasons that this person is is interacting with me like this so um and get curious instead of being defensive or or whatever getting upset it's it's really a time to get curious so um so in any case you asked me about the question about dignity right it's an so, important word to both right of you. so really my work you know my work with kids and all different kinds of kids but all different kinds of kids. But this interplay that I've been working with for 25 years on the concepts of respect and dignity and in our culture, Western culture, that respect is really used as a word for control and compliance, especially with people who have less power. And young people have less power. And black and brown kids traditionally do have less power. And so respect is a word that we see on the, on the you know, in every school in this country, there is the word respect on a wall. And every day, Every day, kids are in schools where somebody is using their position of respect to not treat someone with dignity. Every day, in all of our schools around the country, and also our public education system is based on control and compliance, and using the word respect to issue that comp control and compliance. And then we also put the word up of integrity. And we put these sound bites up and kids disengage. And kids will say things like, you have to earn my respect to get my respect. Then adults get very reactive about that because it's not, you know, like what's going on with these entitled children. But every kid in this country, regardless of socioeconomic class, and for those of you who know me and know how strongly I am so against, for example, for the most part, youth sports in this country in, in organized travel ways, is because young people are regularly seeing adults in positions of pa of respect and authority i don't care if it's parents coaches whatever they're using the position of respect they have to not treat other people with dignity to abuse the power they have that the position affords them and that is very much the reason why we do i've been I, I'm speaking for myself because this is stuff i've been writing about like obsessively for years is that 
if we are going to use the word respect, we have to give it the gravitas and the actual meaning, like know what the meaning is, which is to admire someone's achievements and how they have achieved it. So respect is earned. Dignity is a given. And dignity, when we're doing anti-racist work, is about seeing someone, acknowledging them, knowing that listening is being prepared to be changed by what you hear. I mean, it's really, dignity gets us forward, but respect in our culture is about control and compliance. And we have this thing in our head about we have to respect our elders, which stops us from speaking truth to power. So it is really important, please hear me, that I really think respect is a very important word and I like it a lot. When I walk in and I'm a teacher, I mean, I still see my, as a mother, as a teacher, as a whatever, but that respect is based on the work I do and the integrity that I hold, not just because I have this position, because there are too many people in positions of power and authority abusing the positions because of this. It is like their insurance policy. So that's why in this book, it was so important for us to keep going back to dignity and saying, dignity is what we are missing. It is not respect, it is dignity. And if we can get there and use that as a guide for our actions, our thoughts and our actions, everything flows from that. And the tactics that we use, our social, mo like our social tactics, our social skills, our understanding about the brain works with emotions, all of those things come from this found bedrock foundation of dignity is a given. And that's the foundation of the book. And, and like for me, it was one of those things where I had an aha moment like, oh, got it. Because especially growing up in the family that I grew up in, yes, you, if you older, we have to respect you regardless of what you say, regardless of how you, what you do. But they heard us in Dallas several days ago. Listen. Oh, they were arguing? We, they, no, didn't hear me. Uh, didn't hear me. Okay. okay. Never mind. I mean, they heard us, they but whether or not okay. they agree. Okay. dinner is going to be different today <laughs> is something, you know. <laughs> but yes, they heard us. Um, but I, when I started thinking about um, how racism works, and when I think about how racism works, it is taking away the dignity of somebody else. It is taking away um, the humanity of somebody else. It's not treating a person as a human being. And so when I started looking at dignity and, and this, I shouldn't have to beg for it, I shouldn't have to prove it, I shouldn't have to earn it, I shouldn't have to do all the things, regardless of all the letters after the name, or all the, it shouldn't have to, because even with the letters, you still get people who are not treated with dignity not treated as human beings. And that is the connection for, um, it's not even a respect, it's not even a, because we also know in this country there were a time when I couldn't look at you in your face. I couldn't make eye contact with you because I couldn't, you know, now that's a sign of respect back then and not too long ago. <laughs> it would have been, oh, you're being disrespectful because you are looking at this white woman in her face, right? And so when we talk about humanity, when we talk about treating each other as human beings, regardless of the status, position, none of that, that's what's missing still in, in our society. Thank you. I just, I actually want to squeeze in one quick question if we can, before we go to Q and A, because I, I don't, I didn't get to well, get- Answer super fast. Yeah, super fast. We're, we're um, because I, I think this one is, again, I want to just highlight one more chapter from the book and questions that a lot of people have. And this one I think is, is one that comes up all the time. Um, and I'll, yeah, so it's, and I have a personal story about this too, um, but it's the idea when someone says, or parents teach their children to say, I don't see color. Ah, because a lot of people wow. think that that's, the good thing to do like we don't see color everybody's equal which is a nice idea in theory but we now know that that's not really the best thing to say and you know in my own experience as a parent my husband who's right up here will remember this story well because when our son who's our oldest was five years old and both of us are, are palestinian um he's darker than i am but um you know we both have prided ourselves in did the dignity thing that you speak you speak of and so uh, my son, when he was in kindergarten, his head teacher was white and the, uh, her assistant teacher was black. And he came home one day and he said, um, I don't like Mr. Blank. Mm -hmm. 
because he's brown and I like peach people better. He had just been reading that book, The did Crayons, when The Crayons. Oh, my God. Out. I went home and I told my husband, I was like, what did you say? I got, we, you know, in the book, yeah. we are not those yes, people. We are not those How people. How did he get that? What the, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Someone, and we child were angry. And, you know, we had to sit him down and all of those things. And I, the instinct actually is, you know, yeah, all people are equal. You don't see color. But this is what I've learned in my anti-racist journey. Is, and, you know, a lot of people say kids aren't racist. Kids see color. They see it, they differentiate it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to talk about, yeah. I don't see color. I think you're, can you synopsize mm -hmm. your story? Because I just think that yeah. really says Try. it. Just really, synopsize. Yeah. synopsize. It's synopsize. in the book. The so y'all yeah, have, yeah, I'm going to not tell yeah. you the whole thing so you yeah. can get the book. But <laughs> um, I remember there was once a teacher and I went to a school that was, I never had a black teacher. I've never had a teacher of color. until I want to say college and then I'm thinking. But anyway, teacher in, in school said to me, like, when I look at you, I don't see color. And I was like, oh. And I went home and told my parents. And my mother did not, uh, she was upset. She did not under, she was like, what? And I was like, isn't that great? Because I was in this program where we travel with music and we travel with choir. And I was really glad that my teacher saw me blend in with everybody and that my voice was as good as everybody else's. And that that's what I heard. My mother heard that us traveling to these different small towns, especially in Texas, there would be some people that not would not be so excited when I got off the bus because they definitely saw my color. And I had to learn like, oh. And my mother said, I need her to see you so that she will look out for you, so that she will look out for your safety, so she would make sure that where you were going, what you do. And I was like, ah. <laughs> now I won't tell you what I said to my teacher because then you gotta, that's why you gotta buy the book. <laughs> She's so yeah. good. She's good. Yeah. She's good. Anything Sorry. you want to add, Rosalind, before we go to Q&A? I think it's okay that maybe we heard, got some well-intentioned lessons when we were growing mm -hmm. up that we need to say, oh, well-intentioned, but impact not so great. And then we just need to let it go. And we need to learn. Mm -hmm. And I like tying that back to the bullying story. Yeah. It's about protection. It's about protecting yeah. people. people. And when we see it and calling it, when we see the kid being bullied, we step in, we don't say, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, actually, so yeah. Can protect you. You know, and the way that I, this that playground thing was, you know that systemic racism thing I was talking about before where we were arguing about it? So I was really trying to figure out what would be the analogy that would, right, that would that people could visualize. And I just want to make it, just put it even more, is that at that playground, on that playground moment, when the child is being hurt, you've got the bystander saying, I'm so sorry. But imagine if the child who's being hurt goes to the teacher and says, this is happening to me. And the teacher says, no, it's not. Or makes an excuse or just backs up the bully. That's the school, that's the institution. And so I really want us to understand like when we go back to these places. Um, and I think it's really interesting also, just to say before we go into Q&A, those, you know, I use that analogy for a child experience because I have had probably countless people come up to me in the last 20 years and tell me of the experience they had when they were young, five years old, six years old, eight years old, whatever, 12 years old, about an experience they had that was painful, a socially painful bullying or some kind of abusive power that happened when they were young. And they remember what the temperature was like. They remember the weather. They remember the kid's name. They remember everything that happened. And it was really important to them. How do we not that, how are we allowing for people to minimize microaggressions? Because when you look at people of color's experience of small things happening to them, right? Like, and they're like, as we say in the book, they're like a million small paper cuts. And you don't want to, every single one you don't want to say something about because it's like, am I really going to say this? Am I really going to say this? And I know this, by the way, in all, you know, every school in the country, all everybody has these experiences. Most people have these experiences. So I want us to think about if we're in the race privileged position and you can relate to, yeah, you know, I was 12 years old and I remember this thing that happened yesterday. I mean, it happened like it was yesterday to just think about if that was happening to you on a consistent basis, not all the time, but just consistent, how would that impact the way that you go through the world as an adult? 
because that's what I think. That's like I'm just constantly trying to figure out how can we get closer to understanding each other's experiences. So I want us to think about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions. Yes. I'm so bossy because it's like. And I have something that I want to say. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Wallace. I work in uh, public relations. Um, I'm curious. Um, uh, after the incident happened, I called a friend of mine, um, a woman who happened to be Jewish, and uh, she said, "Well, I talked to my mother about it. She said, you know, I think it's bad for the blacks." And she was referring to we were talking. We were talking about the Will Smith, Chris Rock slap. Mm. And I'm just curious as to what your perspective is, uh, each of you. Oh, on, Will Smith on hitting Chris Rock during the Oscars? Exactly. I have no thoughts about no, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that was like literally going to be the first time I've ever, I was got really confused for a second. All right, that's the question. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Go ahead, because, um, you know, I. So when I was 16, I actually you, did a do, of course, this is the only time I get to tell the story. When I was 16, I did a duet with the Fresh Prince. Um, Otherwise known as Will Smith. Yeah, but we only we didn't know his real name at the moment. But um, and so, but I would say, I I watched it, and of course, like everybody else did around the world, and I, I did see people say, "Oh no, the blacks, the black community, oh they did this," and but, but then I immediately thought, it's so it's so much that that white people do. Um, and we don't ever say, oh, no, the whites. <laughs> oh, look at, remember the January 6th, couple of blocks? No one said, oh, no, look at the white. But it's amazing to me how, again, all the letters, all the numbers, all the fame, all the fortune, when, you come, when it comes to being a black person, an indigenous person, a person of color in this country, we have to uphold a certain standard to prove that we deserve to be treated with dignity and, and still not. But then it comes to, when it comes to white people doing bad things, we don't ever get, we don't put a blanket over that and say, oh no, look at the white people. We, we don't do that because we wouldn't go anywhere in this country. So that, that's my opinion on the Fresh Prince. <laughs> I think it's also an opportunity to ask that person a really curious question of, um, no, not well, I mean, we oh, could, if we would, right. <laughs> um, that, that would be, that would be interesting. Um, that, no, I think it's a really, it's an important time to actually, when you hear a question like that, to take a moment and say, and ask yourself, like, what's the, que what is the question I want to ask this person right now? And so uh, the default one that's really helpful always when you're sort of taken aback by somebody saying something is, help me understand why you just said the blacks, right? I mean, it's just a default question that controls your brain so that you can recalibrate, but it also moves the conversation forward. So I, that's, what, that's what, if I was taken aback like that, I would have been probably taken aback and I would have uh, said, can you help me understand why you ask why you are seeing this that way as the blacks? Because I'm curious about that. And then you really do have to be curious because if you're gonna if you've had a previous conversation or relationship with this person, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes people sort of take you by surprise, but other times you have a long-standing relationship with people. Where you're like, I can't believe this joker said something like this again, right? And then you think, and then you get like, you know, that thing that happens. And then you're like, I'm going to give you the 25 reasons why you're wrong. And they're going to give you the 25 reasons why they're, why you're wrong. And then it'll be bad. And then you'll defriend them. And then you won't see them until Thanksgiving. And then you'll avoid them. And then you go home, drink too much, go home. So it's really important in that moment to say, I really actually want to know the answer and to be mindful of yourself about what is going on with you. Because as we are very adamant in this book, if there is one thing we want people to stop doing is have, having these kinds of conversations, thinking the goal is to dominate and win. Because when you walk, because <laughs> when you walk out, when you walk, and, and we do this with, we actually had this moment like three years ago, I don't know if you remember this, but we had this moment three years ago, we were taught, it was a group of young people, of young student leaders. It's true. This is 
when we first oh, handed oh. that. And we were talking about, because these are kids who just run their mouths constantly, but like usually in a positive way. And so they, and we were like, all right, they let, and they were going to a school that um, being verbally dominant is actually positive. And, um, and we are not in this to have debates. This is about relationships. And so when we came up with, we all of a sudden realized, oh, people are going and having these conversations. And if they have that feeling when they leave the conversation of, I have just, I have just dominated that person, that is the moment that we say to those people, you have lost, because you have lost, because you have not convinced that person of anything, except for the fact that they don't like you, they feel ashamed, and they resent you even more, and then they go back and find their own little links and all that resource and blah, 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 and they come back to you with your tw their 25 reasons why they're right, and then nothing good happens. So we have a criteria for what is it when you have these conversations that when you're, these, it's, it is that you're asking curious questions, that you do not dominate, that you actually are listening to be prepared to be changed by what you hear, which does not mean you agree. And so these are the things that we are looking for to repair in the smallest of ways our relationships with each other. And we also need to acknowledge, and I think, I'm sure y'all have this book here, which is amazing, The Chaos Machine, right? The, the absolute, like, why are we so angry at each other? Because we've been systematically targeted to be enraged at each other since approximately 2007. And I don't care what it's about. It could be cooking, it could be race relations, it could be anything in this country, we are enraged at each other. And that is because there's been a systemic, targeted campaign for us to be enraged at each other. So we stay and pay attention to the page that we're looking at. So we've got to do this. We've got to see it for what it is and really get away from this dominating each other. Yes, um, I really didn't want to come up here, but I'm surprised that there's not a line up here. They're scared. I'm really, but it, it goes to what you said in your book, in, in your title. Have you read it already? No, oh, that's putting it on your spot. I'm but, sorry, I, I apologize for that. No, it's, I got it's, excited. I got excited. No, I'm just saying that the discomfort of talking about race is indicative of why there's no line here. They were waiting okay. on you. Well, <laughs> anyway, Go ahead. at the ranch. Um, now I forgot what I was going to ask. I'm sorry. We do this, no, it's no, bad. No, no, I'm just, I'll get to it while I'm talking, because if no line's going to form here, I got three or four more. Yeah, okay, two. but um, <laughs> when you talk about race, and uh, I kind of grew up, you know, Cleveland, Ohio area, we're actually from Toni Morrison's hometown. Mm -hmm. Okay, my family's real close to her, but that's not the point. Um, I used race when I was in eighth or ninth grade, and my dad caught me, knew when I was wrong. And from that point on, I could never use race as a reason to fail. Okay, and so I know what you mean when you say, I don't see race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was forced into that by my dad. Okay, if you're wrong, own up to it. Yeah. And so it wasn't until I got into the military that I came face to face with racism in Kentucky, mm -hmm. where the Klan hangs out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and from that point on, I, I wasn't about race, but I studied race and studied people. Mm -hmm because my friends were white, because I played sports, and, and we had to actually play against the black part of town, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, and they had the best athletes, and we ended up beating them, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but it created this friendship among whites with me mm -hmm. that I would have never got mm -hmm. if I hadn't learned race from my dad. Yeah. And so it allowed me to see racism from afar, yeah. and when I got to DC, it just blew me away, Be the, 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 the distinction the racial enclaves. And there were people in the Northwest who told me, I've never been to Southeast. I'm like, it's right across the bridge, man. <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. And, um, and so in our country, when we have, and I'll just be to get to the point on this question, when Re Barack Obama became president, prior to him becoming president, I was giving so many white friends the benefit of the doubt. But once he became president, it was like all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. And like she said about her text messages, I don't know you no more. Mm -hmm. And it broke my heart because I was genuine. I'm, see, when it comes to race, I'm confrontational. I'm not going to cut you no slack if I see you. If, you're, if I got to pull teeth, I'm pulling your hair. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. let's, let's get to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so it really unnerved me because after Barack became president, it's like they just ripped the veneer off. And I just wanted you to uh, speak 
on that um, because those who are uncomfortable speaking about race, when they see after Barack became president, the blatant politi political machinations that were occurring to get back into power from a white power structure. Yeah. And it was, it was blatant. Yeah. And if you got kids watching TV and you're telling your kid about dignity versus race versus all these other attributes of values, how do you explain that when it's on Morning Joe, <laughs> it's yeah. on uh, um, The View, yeah. it comes on at seven later, and if these kids are watching TV because of the pandemic, how as a parent are you going to say, dismiss that? Okay, because now the parent is going to be questioned. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I, I think that one of the proudest moments of my life was being at the inauguration, and it was negative two degrees. With me. Yes. Oh my gosh, it was so cold, y'all. It was so. Most of you were there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and seeing that, and then of course eight years, and I love when people say, "Oh, this country can't be racist because we elected a black president." First of all, we didn't elect anybody um, because there were other people who that, that other person, I can't even remember who ranked against him, but they got votes too. Um, but McCain, then I McCain. also remember who? McCain. McCain, thank you. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but then I also, if you think about the, the articles, the pictures that came out, especially of, of Michelle Obama right. and how racist pictures were, how articles were. And, and again, this, this level of perfection that was for all black people at the time they were in the White House. And then we had a president after Barack Obama left the White House. And it seemed like it gave permission to um, be really, um, I want to say the word racist, but it seems more than that. It's more than, than that. But it gave this permission to, um, to just hate in a way that was not, I think we, were, we knew how to basically hide it or we would put it under the rug, or we were super, but that permission, and I think it's from leadership. And so I always say that when I talk to companies and corporations, I was like, your, your corporation is going to follow the leadership. So if your leadership doesn't come, because you remember that time when all those companies put out statements and you know, had these statements on their website and all this kind of stuff. But then if your president doesn't come to those meetings and if the, the CEO doesn't come to the, those, those organized, organized meetings, the affinity groups or whatever, then it means nothing. It's just cute on your website. And so I think the leadership, because of the leadership that this country had at the time, it gave permission um, to be, to hate. Like, like, I mean, not in my lifetime. I know there are people here that be like, oh, we've been there. Not in my lifetime. No, but, Wait, but, hold on one second, please, sure. sir. Because um, I want to be mindful of time, and I also want people to leave here with some things to really address in their lives that they can do things with. So I'm pretty sure that we've all seen how the word woke has been used now and been um, manipulated and used to demean people who are speaking on anti-racism or anti-discrimination or anything that is perceived where you can look and say, oh, that person's being too sensitive. And so I really want to, I'm very important to both of us that people leave here with like little things that they can do to make a difference. And so the co-option co of the word woke is really important to address and stop. Because woke actually comes from a lyric from a folk, from a folk, uh, folk song from the 1850s, I think, where a person is talking about keeping your eyes open because of the racism that's around them. And it's coming from a song, from a folk, from a folk song. So what's happened is that very effectively it's gotten co-opted to ridicule a person who is seen as obviously over policing like other people's behavior and being sort of self-righteous and annoying and all that kind of stuff. But what happens of course is that when we dismiss the words, we dismiss the per we, we dismiss the person and demean the person behind the words and we dismiss the entire concept. And so it gets us very easily even people that think that they and this is where anti-racism like really where like progressive liberal people are using the word woke also to put people down. Because I'm seeing it and I've been seeing it happen like very effectively in the last six months. Like, well, you know, they're just really woke. You can have issues with the way that people are talking about stuff. We both 
find it very irritating when people are canceling people right away and that they're being self-righteous and anonymously attacking people. Both of us, 100%, I can say we both find that highly irritating on anything because it doesn't, it is not courageous and it is not uncomfortable to attack someone like that. However, if we use that word to dismiss that person, we are buying into the problem. We are contributing to the problem. So we can say, when you walk out of here, when someone says like, well, they're being really woke or whatever, it is, like something like that, what I'd love for you all to say, because this is like a small thing, but it's not, is to say, hey, actually, I'd really like some version in your own words of we'd really, I'd like to know what, what they did that was so irritating to you, but I don't, I'm asking you not to use that word because I don't want to dismiss the importance of the issue. And if they're like, what? You're like, really? Because, what, because for me, that means that we're dismissing the entirety of the issue. And for me, working against racism is important. Or for me, working against this discrimination is important. So I, I get it, people can be irritating. But let's be real careful that we're not joining the people or the, the forces, the institutions, the whatever, that really want to dis really dismantle people's humanity and dignity. So I, I want us to really walk out of here with like very tangible things to be like, oh yeah, right there, woke, uh-uh, I'm not standing for that. Because I contribute to the problem if I don't say anything when I hear that word woke and I don't say anything, we are contributing to the problem. And if you're at like Cleveland Park, Woodley Park, we are very nice people. We hear that stuff. We got to say something. I think we have um, one more question, Alan, right? I'm calling out my neighborhoods. We got our last question. <laughs> Cleveland Park I'm neighbors. calling out my neighborhoods. <laughs> um, following the very courageous example that you all have set, congratulations. This is so important. Your passion and your desire is clearly present. I have not read the book, but I do hear that how to have these conversations based on the questions that individuals are having is what we will gain from this book. My question is, you've opened it up, you've put yourselves out there, at this point you're asking all of us to be put out there, I'm all in. But once we go, will you have additional books, additional materials mm -hmm. to help the schools? I see your face, Roz, but you've done that. <laughs> will you be able to help the teachers I literally that say those things. Just you saying. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> continue, continue. But I, please I continue. Think, will there be more? Because from we Shantara's, have book club books, book club discussions on the website. Yeah. That's a good one, right? It That's is. not good enough. All right. Okay. But I sit where <laughs> Shantara sits. Yeah. yeah. We can't leave our students. You can't say to me, talk about being woke, and then don't tell me how. I want more. I just need to know, are there plans? Are you all thinking about it? Yeah. Are you prepared to go into that space? Yeah. It's OK if you're not. No, no. It's OK. I got an answer. Go ahead. But, but that is my answer. question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank it's you a all. great question. Thank, Thank you. you. So on our website, we have a website called CourageousDiscomfort.com. And if you want us to come to your school or church or organization or synagogue, whatever it is, we actually have a person on that website who can talk to you, who will organize everything, and then we will show up. <laughs> I'm not laughing, laughing. Okay. It's funny. Yeah, I also want to say I feel that I have that the, the, the book does. One of the things I really like about the book is that it does teach you in chapters and how to have the discussion, and I think that that's part of the book as well. But yeah. yes, the continuation. Yes. We yeah. would love to see more. Yes, and and I will also say that we have, um, yes, we do have book club discussion questions. So if you want to form a book club out of you know your own group of friends, you say, hey, let's do a book club on this. And they look at you like, are you crazy? Yes. And so we have the questions already on our website for you. Um, but then also this, we have a journal coming out in 2023 because one of the, you know how people want to hear, I read the book in a day. And one of the things I remember saying to our publisher is that I, I really don't want to hear that from people. I did have a friend yesterday post, she's 78 years old and she posted on Facebook that she did read the book in one day. But then she's like, and now I'm going to read it again because I need to dive deep. But I wanted to read, she said, because I couldn't put it down, which is really sweet. But but the fact that she's going to read it again and that's where she's going to write her questions and you know, and really spend some time, some time with the book. 
So here's here's how I want to answer that question. Number one is I think that this I think that our work is a, and this book as an extension of it is a contribution to having people reimagine their relationships with themselves and others in all different kinds of capacities. So not just race and racism, that is our focus of this book, but we really want people to have like a, an understanding of how to live life in a particular kind of way, in a principled kind of way. Um, so that's the first thing I want you to think about. Second thing, or no, in answer to that question. Second is we both of us um, have been in spaces around the country for a long time, but especially in the last two years where Shantara is going to Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas doing race uh, reconciliation with church groups. And I am going into s school boards and, s and school boards and PTAs around the country, including my own now home state of Colorado, which is very challenged on these areas, extremely challenged. We've gone from, just so we're clear about how things have changed, social emotional learning is now a word that we aren't using a lot anymore in Colorado. We don't use, we have gone in 14 months from having no problems with these issues to having um, not be allowed to use the word equity and inclusion in our classes. Um, and social emotional learning is now a really like problematic word for, pe for a lot of people in Colorado. And so uh, let's just be clear, it's not just in Texas and it's in Virginia. We all know that it's everywhere. So I want us to really think about, and my answer to you is that I am working really hard to figure out on the 20, I'll give you a date. On the 22nd of this month, I will be in front of the Michigan School Board Association as their keynote, which is really brave of the Michigan School Board Association to do that. And we are going, I'm gonna try my hardest to figure out a way to get people to feel included in a conversation where they can calm and realize that we have to repair. And what is the benefit of repairing? And I don't know to the extent, I can just personally, because I haven't, I don't know what I'm going to do in terms of school and things like that. I don't. I don't know. But I do promise you I will try my best to figure out a way to contribute. I just don't know what that's going to look like. Well, on that note, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Shantira and Rosalind, thank you both so very much. Um, we do have copies of their book available back at the registers. So please go back there, purchase a book, and then start your signing line.